Okay, colleagues, so let's continue our reading of the article by Wolf and Leopold. Um, so chapter three is going to be theory of history. Um, and I have to say that so far, um, I, you know, I find this a very useful experience for myself personally. And uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully you do too. Hopefully you do too. Okay, so without further digressions, let's resume. So, <clears throat> and we will see some of the same uh, problems that we have seen already, uh, primarily this notion that Marx does not have a Bible, right? Marx um, is uh, Marx's work is a work in progress. It is sometimes inconsistent. Sometimes he changes his mind, and it's not really finished, right? And we'll see. So, so like interpreting Marx, um, you have to make a lot of decisions. Okay, let's go back to the text. So, theory of history. Sources. First, let's talk about what books can we look at, right? Marx did not set out his theory of history in great detail. <laughs> so, an, an immediate problem. Marx did not set out his theory of history in great detail. Accordingly, it has to be constructed from a variety of texts, both those which he attempt, uh, in which he, where he attempts to apply a theoretical analysis to past and future historical events, and those of a more purely theoretical nature. Mm -hmm. So, the texts where Marx talks about specific events, specific historical events, but also works which are more theoretical. Mm -hmm. uh, so of the purely theoretical works, probably the most important one is this work. It's, uh, we basically need a one-page excerpt, but it's an excerpt that we need to read very, very carefully. I've actually I've shown you this already during lecture. right? So in the 1858, 1859 preface to a contribution, uh, to critique of political economy, right? So it's a long word with a, compl with a complicated title. Mm -hmm. So this this preface has achieved canonical status. So if you want 1859 preface, usually I just call it preface. However, the manuscripts collected together as the German ideology, co-written with Engels in 1845-46, are also much used early source. Mm. And I've heard some scholars actually question to what extent should we rely on German ideology since it was published way before Das Kapital and maybe there are important changes between the two. Anyway, we shall briefly outline both texts and then look at the reconstruction of Marx's theory of history in the hands of his philosophically most influential recent exponent, G.A. Cohen, Jerry Cohen. So uh, I keep referring to Jerry Cohen, if you've heard the name hopefully in the lectures. Um, Cohen builds on the interpretation of the early Russian Marxist Georgi Prikhanov. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We should, however, be aware uh, that Cohen's interpretation is far from universally accepted. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, I, I personally find Cohen's interpretation interesting, but is it accurate? I mean, it's it's interesting, yeah, but is it exactly what Marx meant? Well. It's not clear. Cohen provides his reconstruction of Marx partly because he was frustrated with existing Hegelian-inspired inspired dialectical interpretations of Marx. Notice, I kind of, you know, I don't really like the word dialectics because I, I feel that most of the time it really obscures what we're talking about. I prefer not to use this word. <laughs> anyway, so Cohen um, was frustrated with existing Hegelian-inspired dialectical interpretations of Marx and what he considered to be the vagueness of the influential works of Louis Althusser. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Vagueness again. So Cohen is sometimes known as his analytical Marxism, trying to make Marx rigorous. Neither of which he felt provided a rigorous account of Marx's views. Yes. However, some scholars believe that interpretation, that the interpretation that we shall focus on is faulty. So Cohen's interpretation is faulty precisely for its insistence or, uh, on a mechanical model. So this is a potential fault, right? Um, and its lack of attention to the dialectic. Okay. One aspect of this criticism is that Cohen's, and uh, by the way, by the way, I should I should probably mention that uh, 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 another figure who's probably not discussed in this book is David Harvey, and David Harvey has a very complicated explanation of uh, 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 Marx's theory of history, and it's not like base and superstructure, but Harvey I think has some like five or six elements there. It's it's really quite daunting. Anyway, uh, with a question mark because I'm not exactly sure what the author means here. Um, so one aspect of this criticism is that Cohen's understanding has a surprisingly small role for the concept of class struggle, which is often 
felt to be central to Marx's theory of history. Cohen's explanation for this is that the 1959 preface on which his interpretation is based does not give prominent role to class struggle and indeed is not explicitly mentioned. Again, this is another important question for us for the exam. Mm -hmm, this is a, an important question for the exam. Um, why is Marx's theory of class struggle so important? Right? And, and in the works of Jerry Cohen, we have a theory of history which de-emphasizes class struggle. We should keep this in mind. Right? So this is something for you to look out for on the exam, should this question arise. Um, yet this reasoning is problematic for it is possible that Marx did not want to write in a manner that would engage the concerns of, of the political censor. Mm, see again, writing against political censorship, and, and therefore writing being not exactly clear. This happens, this happens. Uh, Antonio Gramsci, prison notebooks, right? And uh, with Hegel, with Hegel definitely also, uh, his Reich philosophy to some extent was modified to appease the Prussian censors. Something for us to keep in mind. Mm. And indeed, a uh, a reader aware of the context may be able to detect an implicit reference to class struggle through the inclusion of such phrases as then begins an era of social revolution and that the ideological forms, <laughs> super important phrase we keep rep repeating over and over again, the ideological forms in which men become conscious of the conflict and fight it out. <laughs> Hence, it does not follow that Marx himself thought that the concept of class struggle was relatively unimportant. Furthermore, when a critique of political economy was replaced by Das Kapital, Marx made no attempt to keep the 1959 preface in print. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, interesting, interesting. So it's a preface that Marx removed from print from, for whichever reason. And its content is reproduced just as a very much abridged footnote, footnote in, in Das Kapital. Yeah, there are some very important footnotes. David Harvey talks about this. Um, nevertheless, we shall concentrate here on Cohen's interpretation, as no other account has been set out with comparable rigor, precision, and detail. Mm -hmm. So, and again, do I recommend you do the same thing on the exam? Possibly, possibly. Again, like, use Cohen as your starting point. You don't have to agree with Cohen, but Cohen gives a certain, again, uh, 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 he gives a clear line of argument with which you can agree or with which you can disagree, basically. It's, it's, it's a very convenient starting point. Anyway, um, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm, next section. Early formulations. In his thesis on Forbach, Marx provides a background of what would become his theory of history by stating uh, his objection to all hitherto existing materialism and idealism. Mm -hmm. So Marx rejects previous materialism, but but also, more importantly, previous idealism, but materialism also, right, understood as types of philosophical theories. Materialism is, a, is complemented for uh, understanding the physical reality of the world, but is criticized for ignoring the active role of human subject in creating the world we perceive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting, right? So Marx modifies, pre so it's like Marx is not straightforward, vulgar materialism, like it, huh? because among other things, he acknowledges the active role of human subject in creating the world we perceive through labor, I guess, but also through, are we talking about, well, maybe some other things as well. Anyway, idealism, at least as developed by Hegel, understands the active nature of human subject. So here we understand the active nature of human subject, but confines it to thought or contemplation. Mm -hmm. So idealism is good, but confined to, to thought and contemplation. The world is created through the categories we impose on it. Yeah, so this is... A, kind of idea, Kantian idea of active categories of perception compared to Kant. We talked about this last year. Uh, Marx combines the insights of both traditions to propose a view in which human beings do indeed create or at least transform the world they find themselves in. But this transformation happens not in thought, but through, ac through actual material activity. Mm -hmm. So, labor reshaping the conditions of our environment. Not through the imposition of sublime concepts, but through the sweat of the brow with picks and shovels. Let me just maybe pause here. I think, again, something very important to keep in mind. Um, Marx, what I'm saying is that Marx's insight is very important. Like, if you, if you talk about somebody like, again, René, uh, René Descartes or Immanuel Kant, so there's an implicit criticism of uh, a Cartesian co cogito of the Descartes, the, uh, I think, therefore, I am. Right, because Marx is going to say, well, actually, as a matter of, uh, of uh, uh, history, 
um, as a matter of history, right? Before you can be somebody like Descartes and, you know, get lost in your thoughts somewhere deep in a stove in Bohemia, right? Uh, uh, you need to have conditions, you know, like thought or f philosophy in general has social conditions, right? So um, Aristotle, speaking about slaves, can only speak about slaves because slaves provide for his existence. Likewise, likewise, Descartes can imagine himself to be like th this disembodied spirit only because there are <laughs> able-bodied men and women who provide his subsistence. Mm -hmm. so, so implicit criticism of, you know, Cartesian cogito. Let me write Descartes' cogito. Well taken, well taken. I, I think it's important to keep in mind again. Uh, Martin Heidegger talks about something similar. Um, um, so this historical version of materialism, which you to, so, so we're talking about historical materialism, historical version of materialism, uh, which according to Marx transcends and thus rejects all existing philosophical thought, is the foundation of Marx's later theory of history. Mm -hmm. So we criticize implicit criticism of Descartes, but not just Descartes, also Aristotle, but actually <laughs> all existing philosophical thought. Okay. As Marx puts it in the, in the 1844 manuscripts, industry is the actual historical relationship of nature to man. Industry is the actual historical relationship of nature to man. This thought, derived from reflection on the, on the history of philosophy, together with his experience of social and economic realities as a journalist, sets the agenda for all Marx's future work. <laughs> okay, so this is thesis on Forbach. Um, next work. In the German ideology, manu uh, so, so in the unpublished manuscripts of the German ideology, Marx and Engels contrast their view, sorry, their, their new materialist method with the idealism that had ca characterized previous German thought. Accordingly, they take pains to set out the premises of the materialist method. They start, they say, from the real human beings. Mm -hmm. The first uh, uh, premise of human history is that human beings need to be alive in order for that to be human history emphasizing that human beings are essentially productive. Mm -hmm. so, so in order to live, we need to produce our food at the very least, in that they must produce their means of subsistence in order to satisfy their material needs. Yes. The set, so, so, so in many ways, the first premise of all history is the satisfaction of material needs, food, shelter, reproduction. Right? The satisfaction of needs engenders new needs. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, uh, needs lead to new needs of both material and social kind. It's kind of... Um, let me make it, maybe make it just a slight note here, right? So this is a bit of an interpretive issue. What exactly does Marx mean that needs lead to new needs? But it's important that in the course of history, human needs develop, get more and more needs, more extravagant needs. And in communism, presumably, we're going to have even more needs, and we're going to be able to satisfy them even more. So our needs develop, but also our forces of production develop. Anyway, um, so... So satisfaction of needs engenders new needs, both material and social kind, and forms of society arise corresponding to the state of development of human productive forces. Let me also give you, give you an example. Wendy Brown, in the Berkeley Lectures, when she talks about, uh, it explains this passage from the German ideology, she gives this example. Like, I need food, so in, in, order, to need, you know, in order to get food, I, I, let's say I need to hunt. So if I need to hunt, maybe let's say I need uh, a spear or a bow. But now that I need a spear or a bow, I need a better spear or a better bow. I need a, uh, you know, piece of stone appropriate to serve as a tip of the spear, let's say, right? So, and in order to, let's say, maybe maybe I want to find this sto stone like that, just like that, but maybe I want to make a stone or improve upon it. So I need a tool to improve on the stone. And if I need a tool, maybe I need something else, you know, to improve on the tool. Or maybe I need the free time to craft my, uh, to, to, to improve my skill of uh, uh, working this stone tool, right? And uh, maybe eventually down the line, I want to uh, not actually hunt, but just focus on making the bow uh, and make use of, of this free time. And now I need you to provide food for me in exchange for the bow that I will give to you, right? So it's kind of, you see how needs lead to new needs. This is, this is Wendy Brown's example. I hope it makes sense. Anyway, 
uh, material life determines or at least conditions the social life. Um, again, spent quite a lot of time in the seminar already talking about this, but um, again, there are, there are vulgar, primitive ways of thinking about materialism, which don't make materialism into an interesting doctrine, but in general, I think it's important for us to understand that, again, material life, or, or if you want, technology of production, of, you know, production of satisfaction for the basic needs, right? Uh, this technology impacts the kind of material social relations that we can have, right? So uh, large-scale subsistence agriculture goes together well with feudal modes of arrangement, right? So, so, so politics, politics, the, the, the boundaries of politics are to some extent determined or at least conditioned, right, by the technology of production, right? And uh, likewise, formal freedom and equality goes together well with capitalism, or in some sense, let me, let me rephrase this differently, in order for people to be free, to engage in uh, the kind of, you know, democratic enterprise, at least formally democratic enterprise, which underlies capitalism for Marx, people need to be free from the uh, constraints of the feudal mode of production, of this, again, large-scale agriculture. People need to be free to move between jobs. People need to be, again, as Marx says, free, also free from the means of subsistence, right? So people uh, should be able to feed themselves with a wage. So you get money, and you should be able to go to a market and buy food there. Right? So this is also part of, in general, if you want this, material life, material life. And it's a big difference. Does your technology allow for that? And in some sense, uh, subsistence agriculture of the, of the Middle Ages most of the time doesn't, doesn't allow for large-scale uh, commodity exchange in the market in terms of you know, buying and selling food, being able to feed, to feed literally thousands of workers who do not produce food but buy their food, right? but produce something else, produce pins or wheels or cars or what have you, right? Mm -mm. And also, let me make this note, right? So we talk about, yeah, so, 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 so again, material life determines or at least conditions social life, and, is, and so the primary direction of social explanation is from material production to social forms, social forms, and therefore the forms of consciousness, right? And I think this also makes a lot of sense, you see? Again, and this is another criticism of Descartes, right? Our consciousness does not just appear from nowhere, doesn't spring out from like in, in, in a complete form like Athena from the head of Zeus. Um, I wake up in the morning, I have certain thoughts, I have certain ideas, I have certain desires. And these thoughts, ideas, or, and desires, to a very large extent, are conditioned, determined by the material life and the, and the social forms in which I find myself. And if I was... Uh, let's say a medieval peasant, I'd wake up and I, I'd think about my fields, I'd think about my crops, maybe about my animals, right? So th these things would be on the, on the mind. Like, I would pay a lot of attention to the weather. Um, you know, maybe the taxation system, uh, like, kind of, or, or, or the corvée system, but I have to do work on the Lord's land, right? These things would preoccupy my consciousness. These would, this is what my thoughts would be about, right? Uh, but, you know, in 2021, I wake up, I don't have to worry about, it's, it's actually, it's actually uh, minus 30 degrees Celsius outside, so it's actually terribly cold, <laughs> but I don't have to worry about that. I wake up in the morning, I uh, check up on the latest news, I see, you know, this morning I saw Na Na NASA has uh, um, released the footage from its uh, rover landing on Mars. So, you know, I'm thinking about that. Okay, interesting, interesting. What happens with, with the Perseverance on Mars, right? And, and after that, I switch on my computer, connect to the Internet, and stream directly to everybody who wants to see this. I stream directly this uh, uh, wonderful article written by a wonderful professor from the University of Oxford, right? Uh, thousands of kilometers uh, uh, from me. A long time ago, and I seamlessly read his text, annotate it, and comment on it, you know, re refer to something else. So, again, you can see how my thoughts, yeah, maybe to some extent they are my own, to some extent, to some small extent, but to a very large extent, again, my thoughts are a product of my environment. Right? And in this sense, again, I had this very haphazard, uh, I don't want to say very haphazard, but somewhat chaotic video about do I exist, do I exist? I think if you, ref again, on, on the one hand, you can talk about neurobiology and uh, neurobiological definition of materialism, I think, would be important for Marx, but he doesn't know much about that, right? Um, uh, but 
On the other hand, if you don't, so in, in terms of neurobiology, human beings are agglomerations of different cells, right? And uh, we are in a symbiotic relationship with uh, colonies of bacteria. Uh, and again, science, biologists always come up with a different number, but I think there's you know, about as many uh, uh, bacterial cells in our bodies as there, as there are cells, of, like our own cells with our own DNA. So to what extent are, you know, to what extent am I me, right? And not just an agglomeration of different uh, cells, organelles, organs, bacteria, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So this is this is the neurobiological side. But this, this, this is not this is not what Marx is talking about. This is not what Marx is talking about. Although although I think it, it jibes well, it it kind of, it fits well with his picture. But he doesn't know about it. Uh, what Marx does talk about is again on, on the other hand, on the other hand, if you think from the term from the um, standpoint of social theory, if you think from the standpoint of sociology, where do your thoughts come from? You can see that uh, I can see that the, 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 the speech I'm recording right now, to a very large extent, this is not my speech. This is a regurgitation of uh, uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of hours that I have spent reading and listening to other people. Right, so so in many ways it's it's it is a collaborative enterprise, and I am just a node. I am just a you know, a computational node in this flow of information, if you want. Um, so at least one way of putting it. One way of putting it. But again, uh, the the collective uh, element of production of knowledge, I think, is important. Right. That this article was not written by one man. Right. It is a collaboration. Uh, yeah, it was written by two people, but it was written by many more than just these two people, because you have to include all the influences on their thought, their teachers, you know, people who taught them to read Marx, and all the references at the, at the end of the article, and all the references to which those works refer, right? Proliferation. So, so in this sense, uh, Daniel Dennett, Daniel Dennett, in the Cambridge Companion to Darwin, I think has a nice article, it's called In Darwin's Wake, Who Am I? In Darwin's Wake, Who Am I? And, and Dennett says that, Actually, it's not just me, Daniel Dennett, re writing this article. And he lists the most important uh, uh, influences, literally influences of his life. He lists people like uh, Jorge Luis Borges, for example, <laughs> as a, as a uh, tacit co-author of this article. right? And I could list my teachers as tacit co-authors of this uh, YouTube video that I'm making right now. Okay, 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 okay. Let's go back to the text. But I hope, I hope that these kinds of explanations make... Uh, this fairly dry and fairly technical text slightly more clear and maybe even more interesting. Okay, okay, okay. Back to uh, Wolf and Leopold. Mm. Yes. So as the material forces of production develop, modes of cooperation, and again, notice, once you start looking for cooperation, you begin to see cooperation everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This, again, this article in front of us is a result of a co is of cooperation. Me reading this article is also a cooperative enterprise. In some sense, you know, people who made the microphone on which I'm recording this right now are also in cooperation with me, in an important sense of the word. Anyway, um, so yes, so as material means of production develop, the modes, the modes of cooperation or economic structures rise and fall, and eventually communism will become a real possibility. Hmm, communism will become, will become a real possibility once the plight of the workers and their awareness of an alternative, uh, of an alternative motivates them sufficiently to become revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. So, I really like the careful way in which this uh, passage is phrased. Notice, again, one important question for us, for the exam, is, is communism inevitable? Is communism inevitable? Notice, in this, this passage does not, does not say that communism is, in, is inevitable. It says that, Eventually, communism will become a real possibility, a, not, an, not an inevitability, but a real possibility. Once the plight of the workers and their awareness of, alternative, of, of, the, of an alternative motivates them sufficiently to become revolutionaries. So the plight of the workers, this is the base side, and uh, workers in a class, as a class in itself. And then they become, have to become aware of an, of an alternative which is workers acquiring self-consciousness and class for itself, right? So, so this is consciousness, class for itself. So that a subjective realization, right? And um, yeah, 
and on, on this side, so the plight of the workers, this is this is uh, material base. So and and in some in some sense, awareness is is a superstructural thing. So this is a class for itself, uh, objective objective conditions. Which have to be realized by people. People be must be must be must become aware of the conflict. I had this quote somewhere here that people become aware of the conflict and fight it out. Probably on the previous page. Okay, 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 okay. Hopefully, we're good. Next section. Yes, we want to cover. Uh, the 1859 preface. So, in the sketch of the German ideology, many of the key elements of historical materialism are present, even if terminology is not yet that of Marx's more mature writings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Marx's statement um, in the preface renders something of, a, of, the, of the same view in sharper form. Cohen's reconstruction of Marx's view in the preface begins from what Cohen calls the development thesis. So what Cohen calls development thesis. So and, and in general, this is going to be, I think, based on Cohen's reconstruction, which is uh, presupposed rather than explicitly stated. Mm -hmm. Presupposed. So not, not really explicit in the text, but we presuppose it as there. Uh, this is the thesis that the productive forces tend to develop in the sense of becoming more powerful over time. The productive forces are the means of production together with productively applicable knowledge. So in this sense, notice that uh, when we talk about materialism, the industrial know-how, the blueprints, the, you know, the, the scientific knowledge is part of the material base. So when we say mat <laughs> Material, right? We include some things which are clearly in the realm of ideas in, in, in there, right? Um, okay, yeah. So, so, in other words, technology, yes. The development thesis states not that the productive forces always do develop, but that there's a tendency, tendency for them to do so. The next thesis is the primacy thesis. So we have the development thesis, now we have the primacy thesis, um, which has two aspects. So the first states that the nature of a society's economic, economic structure is explained by the level of development of its productive forces. And the second, that the nature of the superstructure, the political and legal institutions of society, is explained by the uh, nature of the economic structure. Again, so development thesis, that there's a tendency for productive forces to develop, and the primacy thesis um, comes in two parts. So the first states that the nature of society's economic structure is explained by the level of development of its productive forces. So economic structure is explained by the level of development of productive forces. And the second, that the nature of superstructure Mm -hmm. Superstructure, this important word, um, which is political and legal in institutions of society, is explained by the nature of economic structure. Okay, okay, okay. So, productive forces div condition the economic structure, and the economic structure then conditions the political and ideological superstructure. Okay, hopefully we're clear so far. The nature of a society's ideology, which is to say certain religious, artistic, morals, and philosophical beliefs mm, contained within society, is also explained in terms of its economic structure, although this receives less emphasis, less emphasis in Cohen's interpretation. Okay. For whichever reason. So we're talking more about political and legal structure, right? political and legal, and to, to a larger extent, and not really about ideology. Not really about religious, religion, uh, um, religion, art, or, or morality. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So makes sense. Makes sense. So focus, focus on, on the political and legal institutions, so, uh, in terms of superstructure. Um, 
Okay, indeed, many activities may well combine aspects of both the superstructure and ideology. Religion is constituted both by both institutions and a set of beliefs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Cohen is trying to su separate superstructure and ideology. And religion constitutes, is constituted by both superstructural uh, institutions and ideological beliefs. Okay, okay, that's interesting, that's interesting. I think there was um, one student, Ilya, who was trying to alert my attention to this passage. Mm. So, thank you, Ilya, again. <laughs> Collaborative enterprise. Mm -mm -mm. I have not noticed this passage before. Anyway, revolution uh, and epoch change is understood as the consequence of an economic structure no longer being able to continue to develop as the forces to develop the forces of production. Mm -hmm. So so at some at, at some point, at some point, yeah, yeah. At this point, the development of the productive forces is said to be fettered. Um, so no longer able to continue to develop. Uh, so, so at some point, the, the, the economic structure, okay, this is kind of nuances, nuances. So not just the superstructure, but the economic structure. The economic structure now provides fetters on the growth of the productive forces. And according to the theory, once an economic structure fetters development, it will be revolutionized, burst asunder, burst asunder. And eventually replaced with an economic structure better suited to preside over the continued development of forces of production. Um, let me maybe give you an example right so the idea is that humanity is uh cooperative right and capitalism is based on this competition and private op ownership but as technology develops it becomes impossible it becomes possible for us to have these uh, uh like open collaborative projects collaborative uh, like Free, free from copyright, free from power structures, free from constraints. Uh, so open collaboration, so things like open source software or YouTube channels, right? So, so me, me <laughs> getting this article out in, into, uh, onto YouTube, right? In some form, this is also like an open collaboration. And there's definitely a possibility for, uh, for, for people to do that. However, the, the economic structure of capitalism would say, well, no, you can't actually do this because the te all the texts are owned by somebody, right? So I am reading to you from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy because that's, that's copyrighted by the Stanford University. It's true, it's under the copyright. This text is under copyright, but it is freely available on the web. So I don't think that there's, you know, I don't think that I'm vi violating any... Uh, terms of service by reading this article out loud because it is available for free on the web, right? However, if this was a textbook, there are, there are other uh, sources which I would have preferred to read to you colleagues out loud. But I cannot do that because we are held back by the uh, economic structure of capitalist society. And guess what? Guess what? Most of the um, philosophers I talk to, professional philosophers who have had their books published, don't really get very much from the sales of their books and don't really care very much about the sales. So I would imagine, I would imagine that um, many, most, if not all, uh, the books I would have preferred to read from, their authors would have gladly, would have been, you know, happy, ecstatic that somebody is reading their work on the web and making it available to a larger audience. However, we have this economic structure of capitalism which holds this, in, this uh, uh, um, intention which holds this impulse on their part back, right? And does not allow them to share knowledge freely. And again, that's, 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 that's the point. It's, well, obviously, it's not like capitalism in 2020 has become so <laughs> entrenched that it does not allow any kind of development. No, no, no. But certainly you see a kind of fettering, a kind of fettering how a uh, capitalist mode of um, production capitalist mode of organization of the economic structure holds back humanity's progress in terms of, again, proliferation, dissemination of knowledge, uh, you know, people getting, I don't know, PhDs, people finding cures, cures for cancer, 
people sending rovers to Mars, etc., etc., etc. Right, and, and likewise, we have seen in uh, fighting against COVID that open source and sharing of information for free, right? This quite, you know, maybe, maybe uh, importance, right? Communist elements already under capitalism, right? This free, free sharing of information. Maybe, maybe we have seen that in action in fighting against COVID. Like the, the, the first laboratory, I think, to sequence the DNA of the COVID virus has released the, uh, the sequence openly into the web almost immediately. Or at least that's my perception. Okay, okay, okay. Let's return to the text. So in outline, then, the theory has a pleasing simplicity and power. It seems plausible that human productive power develops over time and plausible, too, that economic structure exists for as long as it can develop the productive forces but will be replaced when they are no longer capable of doing this. Yet, severe problems emerge when we attempt to put more flesh on these bones. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So let's, let's talk about the severe... So we have spoken about uh, co the basic outline of Cohen's interpretation of Marx. Now let's see what are the problems. So, prior to Cohen's work, historical materialism has not been regarded as a coherent view within English language political philosophy. Mm -hmm. Historical materialism. Right. Uh, the antipathy is well summed up in the closing words or, of H. B. Action's uh, 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 Acton, sorry, illusion of the epoch. Marxism is a philosophical farrago. Mm. One difficulty taken particularly seriously by Cohen. By the way, colleagues, so we are, we are looking for arguments and counter-arguments in our mm, essays. Maybe, maybe Acton, in this sense, is, a, is an important name, although I'm not sure, with a question mark. So let's, let, me, let, me, let me put a question mark. One difficulty taken particularly seriously by Cohen is an alleged inconsistency, so alleged inconsistency between the explanatory primacy of the forces of production and certain claims made elsewhere by Marx um, which appear to give the economic structure primacy in explaining the development of uh, the productive forces. Mm -hmm. So alleged inconsistency, primacy of the force of production, and certain claims made elsewhere which appear to give economic structure. Aha, uh -huh. so we want, again, we want to separate force of production and economic structure. And presumably this is important for uh, uh, Cohen's argument. Um, for example, in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels state that the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an a very important quote from the Communist Manifesto. Uh, the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the means of production. This appears to give causal and explanatory primacy to the economic structure of capitalism, which brings about the development of forces of production. <laughs> okay. Cohen accepts that on the surface, at least, this generates a contradiction. Both the economic structure and the development of the productive forces seem to have explanatory priority over each other. Unsatisfied by such vague resolutions as determination is the last instance or the idea of dialectical con uh, connections, Cohen self-consciously attempts to apply the standard, the standard of clarity and rigor of analytical philosophy to provide a reconstructed version of historical materialism. So what Cohen gives us is a reconstruction. So it's less about what Marx himself wrote, but a reconstruction of what Marx must have meant. The key theoretical innovation is to appeal to the notion of functional explanation, also sometimes called consequence explanation. Yeah. So this is this is the, the uh, most important um, idea in Cohen. This is every time I refer to Cohen, this is what I'm referring to. The essential move is cheerfully to admit that the economic structure, such as capitalism, does indeed develop the productive forces, but to add that this, according to the theory, is precisely why we have capitalism when we do. That is, if capitalism failed to develop the productive forces, it would disappear. So we, we, are, we are moving into quasi-Darwinian territory. So we are, we are going to uh, talk about something similar to uh, 
ideas of natural selection. And indeed, this fits beautifully with historical materialism, for Marx asserts that when an economic structure fails to develop the productive forces, when it fetters productive forces, it will be revolutionized and the epoch will change. So the idea of fettering uh, becomes the counterpart to the theory of functional explanations. Essentially, the fettering is what happens when the economic structure becomes dysfunctional. <laughs> Maybe. Now it is apparent that this renders historical materialism consistent. Yet there is a question as to whether it is too high a price. For we must ask whether functional explanation is a coherent methodological device. The problem is that we can ask what is it that makes it the case that, a, that an economic structure will only persist for as long as it develops the productive forces. John Elster, so this is another, Cohen, Elster, Elster and Romer are the three main names in the uh, so-called analytical Marxism. Uh, so John Elster has pressed this criticism against Cohen very hard. Um, if we were to argue that there's an agent guiding history who has uh, uh, the purpose that productive forces should be developed as much as possible, then it would make sense that such an agent would intervene in history to carry out this purpose by selecting, selecting the economic structures which do the best job. However, it is clear that Marx makes no such metaphysical assumptions. So when we say, when we talk about an agent of history, we're talking about maybe you know Hegel's Weltgeist, the world spirit. Elster is very critical sometimes of Marx, sometimes of Cohen, of the idea uh, of appealing to purposes in history without those being purposes of anyone. <laughs> in, in, so this is again say hi to. So, uh, uh, anti-teleology, anti-teleology, a very important notion. Um, uh, indeed, Elster's criticism was anticipated in fascinating terms by uh, um, Simone Weil, uh, who thinks Marx's appeal to history, to history's purposes, to the influence of Hegel on his thought, right? So, again, Hegelian Weltgeist, right? We must remember that Hegelian. We must remember the Hegelian origins of Marxist thought. Hegel believed in a hidden mind at work in the universe. Hidden mind at work in the universe. By the way, you can always you can also have a secular interpretation of Hegel. So I'm not I'm not even sure if this is, uh, you know, this hidden mind at work in the universe. I'm not even sure if this is fair with respect to Hegel. But let's continue. And that the history of the world is simply the history of this my, of this world mind, Weltgeist, world spirit, which, um, as in the case of everything spiritual, tends indefinitely towards perfection. Marx claimed to put back on its feet the Hegelian dialectic, which he accused of being upside down, by substituting matter for mind as the motive power of history. But by an extraordinary paradox, he conceived history starting from this rectification as though he attributed to matter what is the very essence of mind, an unceasing aspiration towards the best. Needless to say, I think this is a very bad reading of Marx. <laughs> anyway, uh, but let's continue. Cohen is well aware of the difficulty of appealing to purposes in history, but he defends the use of functional explanation by comparing its use in historical materialism with the evolutionary mm -hmm, biology. So this is, this is, again, functionalist explanation uh, um, by analogy from evolutionary biology. So basically, we are, we are explaining a way, appearance of purpose by um, appeal to something, to something like, a mechanism, like a mechanism of natural selection. Mm -hmm. In contemporary biology, it is commonplace to explain the existence of, let's say, the stripes of a tiger or the hollow bones of a bird by pointing to the function of these features. Here we have apparent purposes, apparent purposes, right? Which are not the purposes of anyone. The obvious counter, however, is that in evolutionary biology, we can provide a causal story to underpin these functional explanations. It is a story involving chance variation and survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. Therefore, these functional explanations are sustained by a complex causal feedback loop complex causal feedback loop, which in dysfunctional elements tends to be filtered out in competition with better functioning elements. Cohen co calls such background accounts elaborations, and he concedes that the functional explanation are in need of elaborations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So basically Cohen is saying that Marx's picture is incomplete and in need of elaborations, which would provide a uh, similar mechanism, right, this 
complex causal feedback loop. But Cohen points out that the standard causal explanations are equally in need of elaborations. <laughs> right? We might, for example, be satisfied with the explanation that the vase broke because it was dropped on the floor, but a great deal of further information is needed to explain why this explanation works. Mm, yeah, yeah. Vase broke because it was dropped on the floor. Yeah. What was the, ma what was the vase made of? What is the gravity of the Earth? What was the floor made of? Right? Um, what is gravity? <laughs> right? What holds matter together? The strong, the weak nuclear interactions, right? So, so explaining why the vase broke also <laughs> requires, you know, this complex uh, 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 elaborations. Anyway, consequently, claim, uh, Cohen claims that we can uh, um, be justified in offering a functional explanation even when we are in ignorance of its elaborations. So, if you want like a, pro a provisional explanation. <laughs> Indeed, even in biology, detailed causal elaborations of functional explanations have only been available, have only become available relatively recently, prior to Charles Darwin, mm -hmm. or arguably Lamarck. The only candidate causal elaboration was to appeal to God's purposes. Darwin outlined a very plausible mechanism, but having no genetic theory, so theory of genes, right? Uh, the organic chemistry of, of the cell, right? Um, but having no genetic theory, Darwin was not able to elaborate it into a detailed account. Our knowledge remains incomplete in some respects to this day, in, even in biology, even in biology. And society is so much more complicated. So when I say that uh, sociology is not rocket science, it's harder than rocket science, right? So this is, this is what I'm talking about, right? So sociology is harder than rocket science. Anyway, nevertheless, it seems perfectly reasonable to say that birds have hollow bones in order to facilitate flight. Again, even though the details are not available to us. I, I, I have to tell you, in general, I am very sympathetic to Cohen's picture, and I think that, in general, the idea of evolution and natural selection is one of the key ideas uh, in all of human sciences, <laughs> well, I want to say, in our explanation of the world um, uh, today, especially in explanation of you know living organisms, biology, but also society, psychology, etc., etc. So, like, I'm not what's the right phrase? I am very, I'm very happy to take evolution on board with um, Marx. Not to mention again that Marx wanted to dedicate. Das Kapital to Charles Darwin. I think he changed his mind and decided not to, but I'm not exactly sure what, what's the story there. Anyway, let's go back to the text. Cohen's point is that the weight of evidence that organisms are adapted to their environment would permit even a pre-Darwinian atheist to assert this functional explanation with justification. Hence, one can be justified in offering a functional explanation even, if, even in the absence of candidate elaboration, if there is sufficient weight of, in, of inductive evidence. So basically, we are saying that there is some preliminary evidence in favor of Marx's theory, but Marx, in principle, it is a, work, it is a project of work in progress, and the details of Marx's story need to be filled in, if you want to listen, micro-foundations of Marxism, right? They need to be filled in uh, later on. So I, I actually, I talked to, so <laughs> let me write this, micro-foundations. I've actually, I've, um, I, I've, I have given you a clip. In the previous video, I talked about a clip um, from, um, I think, Jamie Edwards, who precisely talked about the micro-foundations uh, of uh, um, Marx's notion of ideology. Again, you can know what ideology is without being able to offer a detailed account of the way ideology is supposed to function in terms of human psychology, in terms of neurons and synapses in the human brain, right? We, we, we do this all the time, and, you know, it's, it's amazing that, for example, uh, well, I don't want to say amazing, right, but it's, an, it's a very uh, non-trivial fact about society, or, uh, not society, but uh, science. It's a non-trivial fact about science in general that um, we can have um, levels of theory, right? Uh, anyway, let me give you an example because I'm not sure if I, I can phrase it correctly. So, chemistry was a successful science before we discovered the quantum mechanical nature of the chemical bond. Chemistry was a successful science before we understood the quantum mechanical underpinnings of chemistry. <laughs> okay. 
At this point, the issue then divides into theoretical question and an empirical one. The empirical question is whether or not there is evidence that forms of society exist only for so long as they advance productive power and are replaced by revolution when they fail. Hence, one must admit the empirical record is patchy at best, and there appear to have been long periods of stagnation, even regression, when dysfunctional economic structures were not revolutionized. So we're talking about uh, problems. Now, problems with Cohen's account. So we have this empirical question of whether it's actually true uh, that you know, as soon as the economic structure begins to fatter, the force of production will be th overthrown. The theoretical issue is whether um, a plausible uh, elaborating explanation is available to underpin Marxist explanations. Right? Here, there is something of a dilemma. In the first instance, it is, tempted, it is tempting to mimic the elaboration given to the Darwinian story and appeal to chance variation and survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. In this case, the fittest would mean most able to preside over the development of productive forces. Chance variation would be a matter of people trying out new types of economic relations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On this account, new economic structures begin through experiment, but thrive and persist through their success in developing the productive forces. However, the problem is that such an account would seem to induce a larger element of contingency than Marx seeks. Right? So, so this would introduce too much randomness, it seems. For it is essential to Marx's thought that one should be able to predict the eventual arrival of communism. Well, one should be able to predict the eventual arrival of communism. I'm not sure if that's actually the case. So let me, let me point some question marks. Is it true that, that communism is inevitable? Is it true that we can predict it? Or maybe, maybe Marx was wrong. And again, this uh, uh, a more rigorous elaboration of Marx in the hands of Cohen shows us that a Marxist cannot really expect the, uh, uh, necessarily expect the eventual arrival of communism. But let's continue. Within Darwinian theory, there is no warrant for long-term predictions for uh, everything depends on contingencies of particular situations. A similar heavy element of contingency would be inherited by a form of historical materialism developed by analogy with evolutionary biology. The dilemma then is that the best model for developing the theory makes predictions based on, on the theory. Mm -hmm. The dilemma then is that the best model for developing the theory makes predictions based on the theory unsound, yet the whole point of the theory is predictive. Well, again, I'm not sure about that. Hence, one must look one must either look for an alternative means of producing elaborate, elaborating explanations or give up the predictive ambitions of the theory. Mm -hmm. Hence, one must look either for an alternative means or give up the predictive ambitions of the theory. I, uh, uh, my, my own inclination is maybe to give up the predictive ambitions of the theory. Um, partly because I think just in general it is implausible that in the social sciences we should be able to predict things with accuracy. Hmm. When, you know, all this is a complicated story, something definitely for us to discuss in the seminar, hopefully. Okay, 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 okay. So we're almost done. We have one page left. So let's, let's finish with this page. The driving force of history in Cohen's reconstruction of Marx is the development of the productive forces the most important of which is technology. But what is it that drives such development? Ultimately, in Cohen's account, it is human rationality. Human beings have to um, have the ingenuity to apply themselves to develop means to address the scarcity they find. Scarcity. Mm -hmm. This, is on, this, on the face of it, seems very reasonable. Yet, there are, again, difficulties. As Cohen himself acknowledges, societies do not always do what would be rational for an individual to do. Coordination problems may stand in our way. Ah, yeah, the free rider problem, the fool's problem. And therefore, there may be structural barriers. Uh, furthermore, it is relatively rare for those who introduce new technologies to be motivated by the need to address scarcity. Rather, under capitalism, the profit motive is the key. Yeah, I think that people who introduce new technologies often need to be free from scarcity in order to experiment. But, you know, maybe. Of course, it might be argued that um, 
This is the social form that the material needed to address scarcity takes under capitalism. But still, one may raise the question whether the need to address scarcity always has the influence that it appears to have taken on in modern times. For example, a ruling class's absolute determination to hold on to power may have led to economically stagnant societies. Yeah. Is it possible? Is it possible that the ruling class in 2020 holding on to power is leading to economic stagnation of capitalism? <laughs> With a question mark. Alternatively, it might be thought that a society may put religion or the protection of traditional ways of life ahead of economic needs. So put something else ahead of economic needs. This goes to the heart of Marx's theory that man is an essentially productive being and that the locus of interaction with the world is industry. As Cohen himself later argued in essays such as Reconsidering Historical Materialism, the emphasis on production may appear one-sided and ignore the powerful elements of human nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Such a criticism chimes with the criticism from the previous section, that the historical record may not, in fact, display the tendency to growth in productive forces assumed by the theory. Hmm. Well, I have some thoughts about this, but I'm, I, probably it's best if I don't share them, because uh, I need to think about it some more. Anyway, alternative interpretations. But you colleagues, colleagues, think about this, think about this. Again, something, valid discussion for you to have in your exams, in your essays. Many defenders of Marx will argue that the problems stated are problems for Cohen's interpretation of Marx rather than for Marx himself. It is possible to argue, for example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, problems for Cohen, Cohen's interpretation rather than problems for Marx. It is possible to argue, for example, that Marx did not have a general theory of history. Maybe... Marx did not have a general theory of history, but rather was a social scientist observing and encouraging, observing, and so Marx is an activist, encouraging a transformation of capitalism into communism as a singular event, as a singular event. And it is certainly true that when Marx, Marx's, Marx's analysis, sorry, it is certainly true that when Marx analyzes a particular historical episode, as he does, for example, in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, any idea of uh, fitting e events into a fixed pattern of history seems very far from Marx's mind. Mm -hmm. So we see that when Marx is actually talking about specific historical events, he doesn't try to shoehorn them into a simplistic reductionist theory of history. On other views, Marx did have a general theory of history, but it is... So, 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 so this is... This is Possibility number one. And this is going to be possibility number two. Uh, so on other views, uh, Marx did have a general theory of history, but it is far more flexible and less determinate than Cohen insists. Far more flexible and less determinate. Um... Miller, I think Richard Miller, we have a reading from Miller in Khan. Anyway, and finally, as noted, uh, there are critics who believe that Cohen's interpretation is entirely wrong-headed owing to its dismissive attitude to, towards dialectical reasoning. Okay, okay, okay. So the next section is going to be about economics, labor theory of value. So, talk about history. It's not the easiest section, definitely, to talk about, but... It's important, and Cohen's functionalist analysis uh, uh, comes up all over the place. So I think uh, uh, we're going to pause here. Again, colleagues, I hope that uh, you will have found this useful or stimulating. So as always, stay safe, take care, and we'll continue next time.